Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May peace be upon you all. First of all, I wish to thank the Islamic Renaissance Front and the Islam and Liberty Network for organizing this webinar. And thank you so much, Ahsan, for your very kind words. I'm not so sure I recognize the person you were talking about, but that's all right. Uh, now to all of you listeners, I wish to join you in prayers for your health and happiness. I hope that despite all the restrictions, the sufferings, the anguish, uh, at the end of it, we will all emerge stronger, nobler, and with more humility and humanity. I hope that we will all have a better understanding that we human beings are not the masters of the universe, but only one small part of a larger whole. Now, um, my topic is about COVID-19 and the rule of law. I wish to divide it into four parts. Number one, I wish to give you a bird's eye view of the majestic and multidimensional and evolving concept of the rule of law as uh, uh, N.J. Hassan uh, uh, already pointed out, it's a growing concept, universal concept. Secondly, I will relate the rule of law principles to the realities on the ground in Malaysia uh, ever since the mid-March uh, MCO movement control order was imposed. Thirdly, I'll point out some of the dangers and the dares that stare us in the face because of this pandemic. And fourthly, um, I'll say a few words about what we can and what we should do for the future. Now coming to this concept of the rule of law, it's a really majestic and multidimensional and evolving concept. It's not just a legal doctrine, but has very clear economic, political, social, uh, and historical implications. Uh, I'm going to point out to you, amongst the many, I'm going to point out to you six main dimensions of the concept of rule of law. Number one, legality. Number two, just legality. Number three, limits on executive and legislative powers. Number four, institutions, principles and procedures to safeguard citizens' rights and to supply remedies whenever rights are wronged. And number five, socioeconomic justice. And number six, effective government. Now, coming to the first one, uh, legality. At its inception, this concept of rule of law simply meant that no person shall be deprived of life or liberty or property, save in accordance with law. As long as there was a law, the government was safe. But later on, over the decades, people began to distinguish between rule of law and rule by law. They said simple adherence to the law may not be enough. The law that we adhere to, the law that reigns supreme, must be a just law. There must be just legality. So the law that reigns supreme must have a just and substantive content. It must honor some basic values of life, liberty, property, equality, dignity. Respect for human rights is surely part of the rule of law. But of course, human rights cannot be absolute. Freedom per se has no value. It's what freedom is for. It's the use to which it is put. It's the sense of responsibility and restraint with which freedom is exercised. However, the government, those in power, do not have the authority to limit our freedoms simply because they think it is right to do so. Simply because they think it's necessary or expeditious or reasonable. They must frame their restrictions in accordance with the Constitution. So, for example, the Constitution restricts freedom of religion 
in Article 11, Clause 5, to three constitutionally permissible grounds. Public order, public health, morality. So freedom of religion must therefore be restricted only on these three grounds. You cannot restrict freedom of religion simply on the ground of economy. Because though economy may be a reasonable factor to some, it is not a permissible restriction under Article 11, Clause 5, which lays down the restrictions uh, on freedom of religion. So the point is this, though freedom cannot be absolute, the power of the state also cannot be absolute. In fact, rights are inherent. It is power that needs legal justification. Any restriction the government imposes on our rights must be grounded in the law and anchored in the law. Then thirdly, there must be limits on executive discretion. The idea that the minister may do anything he pleases um, is not acceptable to the doctrine of rule of law. No matter how high and mighty you might be, the law is still above you. Absolute discretions are unacceptable in a uh, legal system with a rule of law. Likewise, parliament cannot be supreme. In Malaysia, Article 4, Clause 1 says, this constitution is the supreme law of the Federation. And any law passed after Mardeka Day, Independence Day, which is inconsistent with this constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. So parliament, too, cannot pass laws that violate constitutional rights. Fourthly, the rights that exist under the law must be backed by remedies because rights without remedies are like lights that do not shine and fires that do not glow. However, I must clarify, remedies that are provided by the law need not be judicial remedies only. They can be parliamentary remedies. They can be remedies before an ombudsman. They can be remedies before a human rights commission. The media may be able to provide expeditious, informal, inexpensive uh, remedial techniques for solving problems. There is, of course, the electoral process. So there should be remedies. Number five, socioeconomic justice. Now, legal guarantees of human rights are not enough. They must be accompanied by socioeconomic mean measures so that formal rights can find expression in reality. A person may have a right to go to the courts, but if he's starving, if he doesn't even know where his food is coming from, the right to go to the court is of not much worth to him. I have to say this very frankly, food is as important as freedom and bread is as important as the ballot box. The legal, economic, educational, and social systems that operate in our country must guarantee the basic necessities of life. They must secure human dignity by ensuring for everyone food, water, shelter, education, health, transport, roads, and opportunities for upward mobility. Now, the quality of a rule of law society should, in my view, be ultimately judged. How good a society is in terms of rule of law should ultimately be judged by the way it attends to the weak, the marginalized, the oppressed, and the disadvantaged. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of the Holy Bible, which says, the last shall be the first. In other words, the weakest are the ones who must receive the greatest attention from the government. Now, may I also point out that when we talk of social justice, we are not only talking of injustices created by the law. We are also talking of what could be called structural or systemic injustices. So, for example, the movement control order says, uh, stay home. But what if you don't have a home? What if someone sleeps under the bridge or he's a pavement dweller? So obviously, um, something needs to be done to assist him to find a shelter. Uh, the National Land Code uh, 
provides for ownership of land. But the Orangasli, the natives, they don't have that piece of paper in the, in the land office which gives them the title. So the law then in that respect is insensitive to their way of life. This could be called systemic or structural injustice. Now, this, this socioeconomic dimension of the rule of law is of immense importance in all third world countries. And this COVID-19 pandemic underlines the need for nations to strengthen measures to protect the weaker sections of society. Uh, there are, um, uh, I'm sure everyone will agree, there are daily wage earners who are now totally lost. Why do they earn their, uh, earn their bread? There are part-time workers, there are becha uh, pullers, there are taxi drivers. So I think the problems of the weaker sections of society will, as you pointed out, in the future, things will not be the same. They'll have to move to the center of our concern. And finally, the sixth element of the rule of law that I want to emphasize is that there must be effective government capable of enforcing the law and ensuring that crime is under control. But of course, in accordance with due process. Now, we must remember that the threat to the rule of law comes as much from government agencies as from private centers of power. Some of these private centers of power, some of these pressure groups have become like a state within a state. Another word for them is um, the deep state. I'm sad to say this, but democracy has degenerated into a government of the elite, for the elite, and by the elite in many countries, including countries like the USA, which used to pride themselves uh, of being the most modern and developed democracy in the world. So um, this is something that we have to take note of. That the government must be effective, capable not only of controlling the criminal elements, but also capable of standing up to undemocratic pressures from elite groups. Now I come to a portion that would be of more interest to um, uh, um, many people, especially the Malaysians. What are the rule of law implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for our society? To begin with, let me say that the drastic measures adopted by the Prevention of Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988, the Movement Control Order, the National Security Council Act, these measures are indeed devastating, but they are unavoidable. Exceptional crises call for exceptional measures. We are almost like at war, but at war with an unseen enemy. However, the point I wish to emphasize is this, that in a rule of law society, the measures that are adopted must preserve human dignity. They must show fidelity to the supreme constitution and to the letter and spirit of the laws in operation. To confront the crisis that we are facing and yet to embrace and to honor the rule of law, I wish to make a few humble suggestions. I have five points in mind for our uh, legal system. First of all, I wish to point out that from the rule of law point of view, an executive order, an executive policy directive instruction or scheme does not amount to law, simply because it was issued by those in authority. As I said earlier, power is not inherent. It must be derived from the law. Power doesn't come from the person. Power doesn't even come from the office. Power comes from the law. It must be grounded, rooted, derived from the law. The word law is defined in our constitution, Article 160, Clause 2, to refer to three things. Number one, written law, by which we mean the constitution, acts of parliament, subsidiary legislation. Secondly, common law, that is judge-made decisions. And thirdly, custom 
to the extent recognized. So by law, the law that binds you and me, by law we mean these three things. Executive orders, schemes, directives, instructions are advisory. They may be very wise, but they are not law. In a court of law, they cannot be the basis for deciding in favor or against a particular party. So the executive has no inherent power. The executive directives must be based on a law and not simply on necessity or expediency or reasonableness. That is not the legal basis for depriving a person of his rights. Courts are not bound to take note of administrative seculars, etc., no matter how well intentioned. So my advice to all COVID-19 authorities, maybe COVID-19 related policies, my uh, uh, advice to them would be that your directives must be based on the law. The law should be either the 1988 Act or the National Security Council Act or the Penal Code or some other law. It's not enough to just issue a directive. Um, uh, employer, you must continue to pay wages to your employees. Uh, I think from the rule of law point of view, you must say under section such and such of such and such act, we hereby instruct you to continue to pay wages to your workers. The authority issuing these directives must be the named authority. Just because you happen to be a minister or a top civil servant doesn't authorize you. You must be the named authority in the law. Under the 1988 Infectious Diseases Control Act, the named authority is the health ministry or its delegate. Under the National Security Council Act, the named authority is the prime minister or his delegate. Other ministers must not issue contradictory directives. That is not in accordance with the rule of law. The next point I wish to make is that we need a lot of special measures laws, maybe one or more, may I call them COVID-19 special measures law. Uh, may I give two or three examples? Bank Nagara has advised that all loans must be frozen for a number of months. A wonderful, uh, very considerate policy. But the question is, on what law is it based? Human Resources Ministry has said salaries must continue to be paid. Now, what's the legal authority for these directives? If an employer refuses to pay the salary, if a bank refuses to freeze the loan and say, no, your loan is due, and if you don't pay the loan, we shall foreclose. And I go to the court. Is the court bound by the directive, by the scheme, by the instruction, or by the law of the land? So the issue is, what's the legal authority for these directives? I humbly plead, we must find the legal authority. If there is none, if there is one, please quote it. If there is none, please create one. There are businesses that are unable to fulfill their obligations. Uh, can these businesses hide under the legal doctrine of frustration or force majeure? There are essential services, for example, like COVID-19 testing, where the price needs to be controlled. There are daily wage earners, hawkers, taxi drivers, refugees, migrant workers, vegetable farmers. They face bleak times. Their lives have been devastated. For, for good reasons, these measures have been adopted, but their lives have been devastated. They need protection. We need COVID-19 special measures law. Most humbly, I wish to point out, many countries are enacting such laws. Our neighbor, good neighbor Singapore, already has such a law in place. A third point I wish to make is that the movement control order has rightly provided for exceptions in relation to essential services. Under the 1988 Act, a large number of services are rightly gazetted 
as essential and therefore exempt from the MCO movement control order. However, I notice as a student of constitutional law, I notice that the courts and parliament have not been exempted. In other words, courts and the judicial services and the system of justice and parliament are not regarded as essential services. In my humble view, this is unconstitutional. Parliament under the constitution, article 55, clause 1, must meet within six months of the last sitting, article 55, clause 1. No ordinary law, and the 1988 law is an ordinary law. The National Security Council Act is an ordinary law. No ordinary law can displace Article 55, Clause 1, which says between the last sitting and the next sitting, no more than six months must pass. So I think Parliament is an essential service, and it should be so gazetted. The courts, under the Constitution, Article 4, Clause 1, the Constitution is the supreme law. What if a law is passed which I wish to challenge as unconstitutional? But the courts may be under lockdown. So I think the system of justice cannot be subjected to the uh, 1988 Act because the Constitution in Article 4, in Article 5, Clause 2, in Article 128, gives the courts a duty under the constitution to do justice. For example, Article 5, Clause 2 says that if someone complains to the court that he has been arrested unlawfully, the court shall inquire into the complaint. So I, I think we need to modify our, our 1988 Act schedule, which lists essential services. Surely Parliament and the courts are essential pillars of our constitutional system and cannot be marginalized by any act of parliament. They cannot be just put in hibernation. A fourth point I wish to make uh, in relation to Malaysia is this, that our prime minister has rightly uh, announced an economic stimulus package of 250 billion plus 10 billion. Not all of this is coming from um, um, the uh, contingencies fund or from the consolidated fund, nevertheless, quite a few billion um, will be spent in providing a stimulus to the economy. Now, in my humble view, this stimulus package must be submitted to parliament for scrutiny and for approval. Parliament is the keeper of our national purse, it is the grand inquest of the nation in the sense that it is supposed to keep the government answerable, accountable, and responsible to the representatives of the people. It is the authority needed to raise taxes and to spend money. The, constitutional, the Constitution wisely envisages situations where unforeseen expenditure will arise. And Articles 101, 102, 103, 104 provide for a retrospective authorization by parliament of expenses that became necessary. But we must go to parliament to have these expenses legitimized and authorized. So despite the noble instructions and intentions of the government, we cannot legally spend money without ultimate parliamentary authorization. I take note um, uh, with regret that Parliament is coming back on May 18, but I made to understand it's coming back only for one day. Um, I have to read some more on that as to what's the rationale for this, but I personally feel that uh, the supplementary budget, the supplementary, uh, the economic stimulus package must be submitted to Parliament for scrutiny and for authorization. May I uh, humbly point out um, that if there is concern, as there ought to be, for the uh, social 
distancing rule. And there are two possible techniques whereby uh, parliament could meet, the courts can meet, and the social distancing could well be achieved. Uh, number one could be that uh, parliament could meet by way of video conferencing, like what we are doing. There's nothing in law to prevent members of parliament um, meeting um, uh, through electronic means. A second technique could be uh, that we could creatively employ the quorum rule. Uh, the Devan Rayat has 222 MPs, but the quorum is only 26 plus Mr. Speaker, so 27. What could happen is this, that all the regions, Sabah Sarawak, Perlis, Malacca, all the regions could send some MPs, opposition could send some MPs, the government could have MPs, and so 50 to 60 MPs could meet and deliberate and in a house that can easily seat uh, 230 or so MPs, there'll be 50 MPs uh, observing social distance. But I think parliament must meet and authorize this expenditure, unless of course the government wants to declare emergency under Article 150 of the Constitution. If emergency is declared, uh, then Parliament can be prorogued or suspended um, for an unlimited time. I'm sure you're aware that in 1969, Parliament was suspended um, for nearly 22 months. Uh, emergency was declared on uh, May 15, 1969. And though Article 55, Clause 1 says that between the last session and the next session, no more than uh, six months must pass. Uh, actually, Parliament came back to session only on February 20th, 1971. That is nearly 22 months later. Uh, a, a final point I wanted to make, which is controversial, but nevertheless needs to be made, that I understand. We have arrested about 10,000 people for violating the movement control order. Now, without doubt, citizens must show fidelity to the law. They must respect the commands of the law. As someone said nicely, we must censor freely, but we must obey promptly. So we have a duty to obey the law. Citizens who don't obey the law should certainly face the music. However, my humble advice would be that those uh, who violate the movement control order should be compounded and as far as possible not arrested, not remanded, not taken to court and not jailed because that, that defeats the social distancing objective that overcrowds our prisons, overcrowds our courts, that creates new clusters and that is self-defeating. Now, Regulation 11, Clause 1 of the two 2020 regulations imposes a 1,000 ringgit fine or six months jail. It does not say clearly that the police may arrest without a warrant. And therefore, uh, the Criminal Procedure Code the first schedule may apply. And there are some lawyers who are questioning that perhaps under the 1988 law, uh, arrest without warrant is not allowed because the CPC, the Criminal Procedure Code first schedule has some rules. So the issue is contentious. My humble advice would be, instead of arresting people, compound them. So these are some of the issues that I feel are very relevant uh, in terms of uh, fidelity to the rule of law and at the same time complying with the need to observe social distancing. Now, some of the challenges and opportunities, I'll be very brief here. I will um, take only about five more minutes. I think one possible um, challenge um, uh, in the future, maybe in the next few weeks or months would be that the government may be forced to declare emergency under Article 150, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution. As you all know, um, the country has 
declared emergency four times in 1964 uh, because of the Indonesian confrontation, 1966 in Sarawak, 1969 the racial riot, 1977 in Kalantan. Now, any emergency in this country or in any country of the world is the enemy of the rule of law and of constitutionalism. So I do hope and pray that we won't have to resort to this measure, but there is this possibility. Alternatively, uh, sorry, not alternatively, a second danger is that uh, because of the unusual circumstances and uh, the murky politics uh, we are going through, parliament may be prorogued or adjourned uh, or suspended, and uh, that would be sad I would regret that because, as I said earlier, Parliament is a pillar of our constitution and it's a pillar of our democracy. And I think uh, in good times and in bad times, in crises and in normal times, Parliament should be sitting to administer the functions assigned to it by the law. A third danger that I see is this, that with the economic stimulus package, uh, which will have to be at the heart of the government, uh, not just immediately, but in the next few years. There is a danger that some of the money allocated for the stimulus package may be siphoned off uh, and not reach the poor. So the question then will be, uh, the economic stimulus package will be a stimulus for whom? For the elite, for the entrenched, members of society or for the poor. Um, um, I, I acknowledge that some of the um, uneconomic use of these funds will not be intentional. It will be unintentional. Nevertheless, it is a fact that in every society, including all democracies, there are pressure groups. There is the deep state. Um, uh, there, are, there is the state within the state that tends to influence policy. So in this area, I think we all, you and I, we all have a challenge um, to be vigilant. The eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I think we must scrutinize, we must constructively criticize, we must offer practical solutions. We must become the ears and eyes of the government. The government on its part must be more consultative in its economic stimulus package. And it must seek the wisdom of non-governmental organizations and citizens and citizens groups who may have ideas as to how to um, tackle the problems, the massive problems we are facing. The media can play a great role. Um, uh, uh, when I talk in terms of the duty of citizens to constructively criticize. I'm reminded of Khalif Abu Bakr Siddiq, who said, if I do well, then help me. And if I act wrongly, then correct me. A further danger that I foresee, not only in Malaysia, but in many, many countries, is that the quarantined radicals in self-isolation may rely on digital means to spread their venom. This is already happening in many Western societies. Malaysia, fortunately, uh, has been spared uh, this kind of thing. Uh, hate crimes uh, may, may increase with the, the quarantine radicals in self-isolation using digi digital means to spread fake news, to spread hatred. So I think we definitely need a, a more effective law on hate speech. I think our police will have to be more vigilant in the area of hate speech. The uh, media, multimedia commission will have to be more vigilant in this area. Then uh, the issue that uh, Mr. Chairman, you raised earlier uh, about religion. Clearly, uh, if this um, movement control order uh, continues to last for a long time, there will be lots of religious groups that will feel um, um, betrayed, that will feel uh, hurt, 
that they are being prevented from performing their religious obligations. Let me give to you, first of all, the constitutional perspective. Under Article 11, freedom of religion, there is freedom of religion. Article 11, Clause 1, it covers three things. The right to profess, the right to practice, the right to propagate. However, Article 11, Clause 5 says very clearly that freedom of religion, all religions, not just Islam, all religions, freedom of religion is subject to any general law relating to public order, public health and morality. Now this Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988, the Movement Control Order, the National Security Council Act, these are clearly laws about public order, public health and morality, and they are sanctioned by the Constitution. So even though Islam is in state hands, it is a state matter. Nevertheless, actually, um, on grounds of public order, public health and morality, the federal government and federal laws can intervene. Please also bear in mind that medicine and public health and prevention of diseases is in federal hands under Schedule 9, List 1, Paragraph 14, and List 3, Paragraph 7 of the Constitution. Uh, if any further uh, measures, if any further technique is needed to regulate freedom of religion, may I point out our Conference of Rulers, Majlis Raja Raja, uh, has the power to deliberate on any matter, and their majesties, as head of the religion of Islam in their regions, can certainly provide uh, guidelines to the religious officers in their states um, to uh, observe precautions. Now coming to the Islamic perspective, surely even in Islam, um, we must not do anything to harm others or even to harm ourselves. There are plenty of hadith um, on that point. And uh, may I go back to the constitutional provision. Uh, in Article 11, Clause 1, there is a right to profess. Now, this right to profess is in no way being affected by the uh, 1988 law or by the um, movement control order. Um, uh, as a Muslim, I believe in the five pillars of Islam, Tawheed, um, prayers, Zakat, fasting, none of them are being affected. Uh, hajj, yes, Hajj is affected, but of course, Hajj is not something that is necessary immediately. It can be postponed. Or I believe in the six pillars of faith, belief in Allah, belief in angels, believe in revealed scriptures from the Torah, the gospel to the Quran, belief in all messengers, belief in the last day, belief in divine determination. Now, Belief in divine determination indeed is there, but that doesn't mean that uh, we must not uh, uh, that we must not take necessary precautions. We must take precautions. Allah helps those who themselves. And uh, may I just point out to you, um, um, as a Muslim, if one were to emphasize rituals, um, uh, having um, um, some bayang bar jamaa. Uh, in in assemblies in the mosque, of course, th that is a problem right now. Uh, but if one were to believe in the spirit of Islam, in the beliefs of Islam, then as I mentioned to you, the five pillars of Islam, the six pillars of faith, are really are not being affected. I have a a favorite passage in the Holy Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, second surah, uh, ayat 177. It says, it is not righteousness that you turn your faces towards east or west, but it is righteousness to believe in God and the last day and the angels and the book and the messengers to spend of your substance out of love for him, for your kin, for orphans, for the needy, for the wayfarer, for those who ask and for the ransom of the slaves to be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity to fulfill the contracts which you have made. So that is also prayer. That is also religion. 
my personal view is this, that our daily life is our religion. Our work is part of our ibadah. And I think in that respect, we are not being prevented from observing our religious obligations. Uh, a, another danger that I foresee uh, in the months or years ahead, and, and I'm afraid uh, I uh, have to rely on Michigan in the USA. Armed protesters have been protesting in Michigan uh, over the movement control. I, I'm afraid that in many societies this may happen. The movement control orders uh, remain in operation. The right to privacy is obviously under severe threat. Um, um, where did I go to? Who was my last contact? Is now all uh, traceable. And uh, sad to say, and that's my last point in terms of danger, uh, there are suggestions uh, which are frighteningly um, close to what could be called eugenics. Uh, in other words, uh, we treat those who are below, let us say, 50 years of age, the aged, the sick, um, uh, people suffering from serious condition should be left to die. Now, uh, that would be quite an unusual thing. If, God forbid, a nation comes to that point, and I'm told in Italy, this was part of the problem during the peak of the crisis, that because hospital beds were limited, that the ventilators were limited, um, they were indulging in what really could be eugenics. So these are some of the dangers. And uh, finally now, what needs to be done? First of all, our legal system uh, needs um, to be made uh, 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 more suitable for this pandemic. I already mentioned this point, that we need more laws to protect workers, to protect those who cannot observe their obligation. Um, to control prices of essential commodities. And for this, I believe we need parliament to sit. Uh, around the world, we need a new model of democracy that guarantees the common good, that reduces poverty and inequality and eliminates capture of the state by the economic and political elite. In the bulk of the so-called democratic states, and I'm sorry I have to use this word, so-called, democratic states. Democracy today exists only in name. It is a captured democracy. Captured democracy. A government of the few over the many. Whether it is the USA, UK, Latin America, and much of Asia, there is a caricatured, formalistic, facade democracy that is existing. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that the government should be weak, not at all. We need strong governments, but we need governments with that do not kowtow to pressure groups and to the deep state. We need governments that uh, adopt more consultative processes. We need a different and newer model of science-based leadership, a leadership that will stand up to pressure groups that will stand up to public opinion. Um, I think Jesse Jackson said, leaders of substance do not follow opinion polls. They mold opinion, not with guns or dollars or position, but with the power of their souls. We need a larger national health allocation. We need greater hospital capacities. In many countries like the USA, there is profit over people. There is cost over care. The healthcare systems are broken down. We need a central epidemic command center like in Taiwan, Iceland, South Korea, and Germany. Now, Malaysia has done fairly well in tackling this crisis, one of the best in the world. But nevertheless, our national allocation for health is below international prescription. So we need to improve on that. I feel that in the years ahead, some industries like poultry, like animal farms, may be the next hotspots for pandemics. We have to keep uh, an eye. And finally, uh, my last point is, we need to be more 
environmentally conscious. This has to become a central concern. We all need to recognize that the human race is only one small part of the larger ecological sphere. Some of us do not seem to understand that there is a difference between being a human being and being human. Many of us in our quest for wealth and power have ceased to be human. And in the years to come, that has to change. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.